Hey everyone, welcome to our talk uh, from 0 to 100, fine tune all the things. My name is Dan Nesfetter and I'm an Android developer at Big Nerd Ranch. And my name is Pablo Guardiola, I'm an Android uh, navigation uh, developer at Mapbox. And today we're going to talk to you all about performance and some of the performance work that Pablo and I did together at Mapbox, uh, working on the Android navigation SDK. So performance is a pretty broad term and can en encompass a lot of different things, especially when it comes to application development. So we wanted to just give like a simple example to start off with, just to give you all an idea of poor performance uh, in your application. So this is a GIF of our turn-by-turn -turn UI, which is actually a UI component that our navigation SDK offers that allows a developer to integrate into their activity or fragment. And you can basically add a in-app navigation experience through, the, through this uh, custom view. But you also notice that the map view is rendering at a pretty choppy pace. Uh, the animation is not fluid. And you know, this is an example of a poor user experience that you do not want to give your users when they're navigating. And especially in the context of navigation, you need a fluid animation to make sure that your user knows where they are along the route at all times, or they may miss a maneuver and have to do a U-turn or you know, be rerouted. And, that just ends up making a lot of angry people. Uh, so you know, we wanted to then dig into all the different pieces of, that, are, that is going into this UI and kind of show the different performance areas that we want to take a look at when we were starting this effort. So one of the first pieces that a lot of y'all are probably familiar with are maps and location services. The blue dot icon on a map denoting your location is something that's familiar to a lot of people and is actually used in a lot of different applications today. So this is just an example of our Maps SDK rendering the current location on the map. And you, know, you, may, you may stop there and say, OK, this is just map rendering with the, with the current location. But there's actually a lot that's going into this. Not only is the map rendering, but we're drawing a custom layer on top of the map that is showing that icon. And at the same time, in the background, we're hitting the device GPS. You know, and for a fluid navigation experience, this is at least once per second that we need current location information in order to provide the best context to the user, to get the freshest information and give them the freshest progress back. Otherwise, you know, we have to go into like, some sort of interpolation, and it gets a little bit complicated at that point. The third piece here is routing. So Mapbox offers a directions API that gives turn-by-turn -turn directions from point A to point B. You know, to get information, you know, where you need to turn, stuff like that. Also, congestion information. So this is a GIF of a route that has been retrieved from our Directions API. And you can see along the route the blue, yellow, and red you know, portions of, of uh, congestion that are denoting the traffic flow there. And you know, it, it, so the routing part of this doesn't stop at the request and response from the API. You actually have to, once you get all that information, parse it and be able to render it in a performant way. For example, if you have a route from Philadelphia to San Francisco, you're getting a massive response full of all sorts of congestion data that, and a, a giant, basically, route geometry that you need to give to the, to the map and be able to render in a performant way where it can handle all of, that, all of those uh, data points. And finally, the part that's probably most relevant to the navigation SDK is route processing. So you have a, a GPS point, you have a route, and you need to basically do all the math to figure out where you are progressing along the route. And this is just an example of a fluid you know, navigation experience without any sort of chop. And it is a GIF being rendered a little weird on this screen. But uh, this is basically where the navigation SDK comes into play. You can see 100 feet to Clifton Road Northeast. You all are probably familiar using Waze or Google Maps. It's the same idea, same experience. So these are just kind of all the areas where we're taking a look at when trying to build out a pipeline that does this. Track performance over time as changes land in the SDK. So the team at Mapbox is not big. You know, we're a few developers that are building this out. So we don't have any team that can basically monitor performance for us. So we basically need to reduce the amount of manual effort that goes into this as much as possible, completely, ideally. Um, but to automate this, you know, it's definitely a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts that go into that, so that's what we're going to kind of dig into today. Some of the tools that we looked at and, you know, how we went about uh, achieving this. But before we do that, we have to take a look at which performance areas we need to look at specifically. Like, what performance metrics 
are we going to be gathering and then and taking a look at and tracking? So the first one is CPU. We need to know over the length of a route from A to B how much CPU and what percentage of the device's CPU are we consuming? You know, this has, this has a lot of different effects, and, and you know, we'll get into those in a bit. Second is RAM. So we also need to know how much RAM we're consuming. You know, the amount of RAM on each device is different, and out-of-memory exceptions are definitely a concern. If the navigation SDK is put into the background and you open up another app that's consuming even more memory, while navigation is still happening, because you know, we can't stop navigation when it's put into the background, then we need to make sure that we're reducing our amount of resources and not causing any sort of uh, you know, shutdowns like Android shutting us down for any particular reason. Third is bandwidth. And this is definitely a concern for, especially today, given like phone carriers and, and the amount that data costs for, for each you know, carrier and plan. We don't want to have the SDK consuming a ton of data and then, as a result, costing our users a lot of money. So we need to make sure that the amount of data that we're consuming, the amount that we're sending, is reduced and efficient in, in how we're doing that. And then finally is battery. And this is probably something that a lot of users notice the most. If you're using an application and it's consuming half of the battery in a matter of you know, two hours, you're probably going to uninstall it or leave a poor review. Um, and th this is something that when, when developers are using the SDK, they want to make sure that they're not worrying about this. And the interesting thing to think about here is all these top three items come into play with battery. The, you know, the more CPU, the more RAM, the more you know, uh, bandwidth that you're consuming, the more battery the, that you're also going to be consuming. You know, your device is drawing power to, to basically power all those different, uh, different facets of, of performance. So one of the first tools that we took a look at may be one of the most obvious. If, if you're an Android developer and you know, you've thought about performance or you know, have seen this in Android Studio when using it, uh, it's the Android Studio Profiler. And there are a lot of great things about the profile that, that we took a look at and naturally gra gravitated to first when we started to look into this work. So the first is real-time readable data. And here's that same GIF again, but this time with the Android Studio Profiler being populated on the right side. And you can see it, it's actually encompassing all the areas that we want to take a look at. CPU, memory, network, and energy. So, this is great because we can basically run the SDK and see in real time what, what's happening from a performance perspective and get, you know, get an idea of, of how we're performing on that given device. So uh, another benefit here is the profiler allows you to record sessions, basically. And, and the, the benefit there is you can record a session, make code changes, look at like, different hotspots within your code, and then go back and record another session you know, with the same user flow. And, compare and contrast and see what kind of performance gains or you know, if your changes actually achieved anything there. And you know, the, it's a detailed analysis. So you, know, you can dig into on a per method basis where performance hotspots may be occurring, you know, where the CPU is taking the most time to process your code and basically execute it. So we basically determined that this is great for an initial signal. We can take a device and ramp up really quickly and figure out what the performance on that device is and like, how our code is performing. But it kind of ended there. And we wanted to go also into, like, does this actually solve our problem? Are we able to achieve that initial goal of tracking performance over time with this tool? And the first thing that we noticed is you can't download or send any of this recorded data. And the whole point of this pipeline is to be able to automate that and be able to you know, send it to our database that we can then query and figure out you know, trends and sort of scenarios like over time. Another thing is a productivity blocker. So when you're running the profiler, you're kind of stuck just running that test. You, you know, for, in our case, we're running five to 10 minute test routes, and we kind of just have to let it run. And we can't be making code changes or like redeploying the test application at that time. So for us, that's, that's a bit of a blocker. We don't want to you know, have, have to wait and sit there while the test runs. Finally, the profiler is API 21 and above. And for context, Mapbox maps and navigation SDKs support API 14 and above. So this is a pretty large gap where we're not able to test devices that are probably some of the most important devices to take a look at, because these lower API versions are also probably lower powered devices where performance is more of a concern than if we're or testing a 
like Pixel 3, for example. So that's a pretty big blind spot that is a bit of a blocker for us as well. And the next thing that we took a look at, and probably where we spent the bulk of our time, was custom test rules. And before we kind of get into the, to what that really is, I think it's just good to give an example of what is a test rule. And if you all have written UI tests in Android, you've, you've probably run into something like this, where you need to access some sort of permission while the test is executing. And it throws a permission exception because you haven't actually accepted that permission in the middle of the test. So the grant permission rule provided by the Android support library allows you to just add this at the top of your test code, and you don't have to worry about any sort of exception when the test is being executed. So in the same idea, we wanted to be able to add uh, a, a rule, basically, that allowed us to collect this performance information while our UI tests are running. That way, we can have a UI test that we can run a lot, of, like, many, many times. And that, that's kind of the goal here, is to be able to create a test that's reproducible. We want to be able to run a, the same test route over and over again so that we can start to gather a lot of performance data and gain a statistical signal. That's kind of a, a, another drawback of the profiler is once you execute it on a device, you have the performance information of the SDK for that device. And you know, that's really not a, a confident you know, statistical, from a statistical standpoint, that's not very confident as far as being able to actually gain insight off of, off of the performance data. So this is just a, a, another GIF of actually one of our UI tests running over and over again, in, in this case just three times for the, for the sake of brevity. But this is the UI starting up and navigation beginning. And probably one of the most crucial points of performance for the UI because the map renderer is firing up, the GPS of the device is firing up, we're fetching a route. Basically all of the initialization code is going on at this point. So you know, this is something that we definitely needed to keep an eye on when it came to performance and gathering data on that. And also the same idea for, for test routes and, and, and such. So the next part is recording and storing the performance data. And you know, this is the part where we need to basically gather the performance data, store it on the device, and then be able to send it to our database. And you know, I think it's best to just kind of dig into, dig into the code here to kind of explain this. So this is actually like part of our custom test rule. And you'll, you'll see kind of a lot going on here, but the, the main thing to focus on is there's, there's two parts, and, and both are use, utilizing an, an ADB tool, the Android Debug Bridge tool dumps us. And this basically is a way to look at system services on Android while you're debugging and gather relevant performance information. So you, you'll notice in the before part of this code, we're actually resetting dumps us. And this is basically to provide a clean slate of data for the test. You know, while the test is executing from you know, point A to point B, we want the performance information to only encompass that test. And Dumpsys, by, by the way it's built, is actually going to be including data prior to when you try to gather the performance data, unless you reset it and kind of start, like, create a starting point. And then you'll see in the after part, we're also using a dumpsys command, basically saying, OK, we want this dumpsys service and this package name, um, the package name being the, uh, the package of our, t of our test app. We're taking the string response, and then we are storing it. And in our case, we're basically going to be storing it on external storage of the device and waiting for this test to execute 30 plus times and then sending it to our database remotely. So just for an implementation example of this, we're, you know, we're specifying CPU info as our dumps of service. And that's basically saying, you know, we only want to gather CPU info with this rule. And it will execute a shell command of this nature where you know, dumps this CPU info and then the test app package name. So this is great. Now we have a way to basically execute our test and store this data to the device you know, for, for fut in future use to send it off. But there was one more question that we had to answer, and that was, what kind of device farm are we going to be using to execute these tests? And we kind of explored a, a bunch of different options, but ended up going with AWS Device Farm for this one of the sole reasons that like, you are able to access device data after the tests have been executed. And this is huge. So we can basically run our tests wait for the test to finish, and then access you know, the, the file structure of the device and, and pull the data that, that we've been storing there the entire time. 
Firebase, unfortunately, d doesn't allow that. So does this solve our problem? For the most part, it, it solves a lot of our problems. But one of the first things that you're going to run into is you need a reliable UI test. And I'm sure you, know, you all have seen all the testing pyramids, and you've seen UI test is at the top of the pyramid. And that's because they're some of the most, like, the hardest tests to write on Android to get reliable, to be able to run over and over again without being flaky. So this is one of the first things that we ran into. We had to iterate on this test and make sure that it could execute 30 times. And in our case, we're running a five-minute test route 30 times. So that's two and a half hours that this test needs to be executing in a, in a reliable fashion. And that was kind of one of the other things we ran into. This is taking a lot of time. You know, that, that's a lot of time to have these, these tests being run. And one of the questions we asked ourselves was, can we actually integrate this as part of our CI pipeline? And the answer is no. Like, <laughs> we we, we want to keep our, our CI time around like 10 to 15 minutes, ideally. So uh, Pablo's actually going to be talking about some of the things we're thinking about in order to you know, uh, still encompass that and, you know, as a part of our CI, but not in a, in a blocking manner. Another thing we, we saw was dumpsys output isn't easily parsed. So here's an example of what that CPU info output actually looks like. And you can see at the top, you can see our, our test app right there. And you may see, oh, OK, 225% of the CPU. Like, what's going on with that? And it's, so it's something that we had to you know, figure out and when we're looking at this is that this is actually the percent of, of, of cores. So this is basically you know, two, two and a quarter cores that are being consumed throughout the, the route. Um, and something that's not easily, you know, that we saw right off the bat. Um, but the, the kind of thing that, the point here is that this is basically just a giant text file that we're storing to the device. So something that, that wasn't super smooth in, in the whole pipeline was we had to write Python to extract the data in order to get like what we actually need here, which is kind of that, that top level there. Also, we found out that you know, and notice that the output data can be unreliable. So sometimes we would see data that is all zeroed out, or some pieces of the data were missing from dump dumpsys. And you know, we haven't quite gone to the bottom of that, but we figure it's probably the way that you know resetting before the test is not accounting for for certain scenarios where you know we shouldn't be resetting or or something of that nature. So now Pablo is actually going to be talking about some of the stuff we're doing in production to, to monitor metrics in that sense, you know, out, outside of a testing environment. Yeah, thank you, Dan. So, yeah, so another approach that uh, we thought that uh, could be uh, interesting for us uh, was like, you know, um, doing or putting some code uh, into the uh, production SDK um, and uh, get some insights from, uh, from um, you know, like, a broader uh, user base, right? So first of all, uh, well, how does this uh, help us? Um, basically, we are getting like a, a signal from a, a real world usage, uh, which means basically that uh, we are not uh, in a like test lab anymore. Uh, so meaning that uh, we are gonna get like more accurate data, like production data, um, and uh, of course. Um, we are gonna um, reach or be targeting a ledger data pool, right? Uh, meaning that uh, we are gonna get like uh, more data uh, faster. And obviously, uh, we are gonna get uh, data from, um, you know, more devices and more operating systems. Uh, because, you know, uh, even using like a, a device farm, um, it is tricky to, you know, like uh, reach the whole, you know, um, um, different devices that uh, are available on Android. Um, this is good, uh, but obviously, <laughs> when when you are following this approach, uh, you are adding uh, code that is gonna be uh, hit by your users, right? So um, we run into some uh, issues uh, that uh, I'm gonna uh, explain now. Uh, first of all. Uh, this is a production uh, environment, uh, which means that uh, you know whatever you are adding, uh, it's gonna you know affect your user. So you need to be 100% sure that uh, what you are doing um, is what uh, you want to do, right? 
And because if not, basically, uh, you will be uh, shooting yourself. And you know, again, uh, your users uh, will start complaining. And uh, you know, uh, this is not good for for your app or uh, you know uh, SDK. Uh, secondly, um, you need to measure. Um, you know, basically, uh, you don't want to introduce any overhead uh, just for the sake of uh, getting metrics. And uh, you know that. Um, this kind of uh, you know like um, instrumentation code could be heavy uh, sometimes. So if you are using this in production, you need to you know uh, be one hundred percent sure that uh, this is not going to affect like the overall performance of your users. Because if not, then uh, you know it, it is funny, right? You are trying to measure uh, telemetry and um, you know like the performance uh, with uh, telemetry. Uh, but you are adding like extra, you know, uh, overhead uh, for for doing that, uh, which will mean that uh, you will be uh, shooting, you know, uh, on your foot uh, yourself. Uh, third, um, you need to uh, be aware of the uh, data consumption, uh, in the sense that, uh, as um, Dan just uh, briefly explained, uh, you are gonna, um, you know. I store like this data maybe um, you know uh, in uh, in the um, storage of the device and uh, at some point you are uh, gonna need to send it uh, somewhere right um, and and again you need to uh, be uh, careful when you send this uh, data and uh, how many requests uh, you are doing because again this this uh, if, if you end up like uh, sending like a bunch of uh, requests that will mean that uh, you are also introducing like uh, this uh, overhead for uh, bandwidth and um, last um, the data normalization uh, and here uh, what I'm trying to explain is like you know that uh, we are reaching like a broader uh, ledger pool, as uh, we uh, said um, in the in the pros, um, which means that uh, in order to get like um, insights, you need to uh, have like a good amount of data, right? So when you are uh, you know targeting like a broader pool, um, means that uh, you are gonna need to wait more until this data is uh, you know uh, signaling uh, you something uh, useful for you uh, imagine that uh, you um, you are you know trying to um, see how bad uh, you know uh, a Samsung device performs uh, and uh, maybe your um, user base uh, you know is not that uh, you know that big in in uh, in that case right so this is gonna take you uh, time until uh, this data uh, gets normalized so now uh, let's talk about the process that uh, we uh, thought that um, you know uh, could uh, solve uh, this um, this uh, effort. Um, you know that the, there's no uh, that many um, documentation and, and you know uh, in general uh, literature about how to do um, you know performance on Android. There is like uh, a bunch of uh, articles uh, and chats like. Um, you know, describing how important it is, but the, you know, at least uh, we we didn't find uh, that many. You know, going into the details. So um, with uh, this talk, we we wanted to you know um, show you uh, how we did it, uh, so uh, we can get feedback and we can contribute uh, to uh, this uh, not uh, happen uh, anymore. So uh, we, we've just uh, briefly touched uh, almost all of it, but uh, uh, we uh, wanted uh, to reiterate on uh, how we did it so you get like the whole idea. Uh, first of all, um, we need like uh, an automated uh, and uh, repeatable um, test suite. Um, of course, this uh, uh, test should be uh, reliable. Uh, and as uh, Dan uh, just showed you, um, we are, um, Creating or implementing these uh, custom roles, um, which uh, you know uh, allows us to basically um, get the data um, and uh, store it in in the uh, storage of, of the device. Then um, we, in our special uh, scenario, uh, we needed to um, create like these uh, control routes, 
And we wanted to um, add uh, like this box um, to uh, make sure that the, you know, in this kind of test, uh, you need to be um, you know like aware of uh, potential noise. So uh, as much as as you can, uh, you need to uh, control any uh, variables that uh, could affect that uh, um, you know like a test. And uh, at the end of the day, that could affect like uh, giving. Uh, you know, noisy uh, results. Finally, um, we um, this uh, test suite is also uh, generating the data, the data, and uh, storing it uh, in the in the device, which uh, you know um, um, give us um, you know to the possibility to go to the next uh, step, which is basically the data processing. Um, and with uh, data processing, uh, basically uh, what uh, we uh, mean is like we are retrieving the data from the, from the device. Uh, we are uh, parsing the data. Um, and as you have uh, been seeing, it, this is not that easy, right? Uh, because, uh, you know, the different, uh, you know, like um, um, uh, files that are generated are really, uh, you know, diverse. And uh, there's uh, no that um, uh, much um, um, like documentation on on dances, uh, for example. So you need to figure it out. Um, you know what values are uh, interesting uh, for you. Uh, and finally, um, we are uh, sending the data to the uh, data warehouse. We uh, assemble uh, everything. Uh, we are uh, packaging it and then uh, sending it to the data warehouse, which you know, uh, brings us to uh, the uh, final phase, which is uh, the data analysis. Um, of course, uh, you uh, now uh, have the data uh, in, your, um, in your database, uh, so you need to query the data, and uh, sometimes uh, you need to uh, filter out uh, that data, uh, because imagine that uh, you want to, you know, only get uh, information of a specific device or uh, a specific uh, operating system, and then, uh, like um, we that that uh, gives you um, like um, the possibility to get um, you know some insights on 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 your data. So basically, that's the uh, fruit of uh, our labors. And just to give you an example, um, this is uh, like the data um, that uh, we are interested in uh, in um, having, right? Uh, here we have an average uh, Java memory consumption graph, uh, which is, um, you know, as you can see, um, is uh, across the different uh, SDK versions. And this is good because uh, this is uh, telling us uh, how, um, you know, how much memory uh, we are uh, consuming uh, on average uh, across the different uh, SDK versions. And that gives us, um, like, you know, a range uh, which uh, goes, uh, you know, in this case, from uh, 6.5 6 to 7, uh, which then uh, we can use to uh, detect, like, uh, future spikes, right? Uh, so if we know, like, uh, we are moving in that range, um, you know, eventually, uh, when we run this uh, kind of a, a performance test, uh, you know, uh, previous uh, to a, a new release, Imagine that uh, uh, these graphs goes, uh, you know, for the, um, the version that uh, we are about to release goes uh, over 10. Then that's uh, signaling uh, something to us, right? Uh, and that's what uh, it is important. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, in what uh, we were interested was uh, to uh, track the performance uh, over time uh, while you know we were adding uh, new new changes to the base code, and while we were releasing new version of the SDK, um, so let me talk uh, about the pipeline. So um, this is more or less you know uh, kind of like um, talk about like the implementation details of the of the process and uh, what tools uh, we use uh, in order to um, to gather all all of this uh, information. Um, first of all, um, you need um, to prepare um, everything uh, and the code. Um, so obviously, uh, you will have a, like a trigger, uh, which basically um, will um, run um, a job uh, in CI, uh, which uh, will uh, pull the SDK code um, and 
uh, in this uh, particular um, uh, step, uh, you need to take uh, into account that uh, you need to make it um, like custom uh, in the sense that uh, you need to be able to specify different uh, SDK versions or um, if you are developing an app, uh, you know, uh, for testing like uh, a different uh, version of the app. Uh, and then uh, you need to um, build the SDK. Uh, in our case, uh, we have like two artifacts. Uh, so we needed to uh, have like a, a scripts uh, to um, create like uh, those artifacts uh, based on the uh, version number. Um, finally, uh, you need to assemble uh, both apps, like the desktop and the regular app, and then you are able to go to the next phase, uh, which is, uh, in our case, as uh, Dan mentioned, we are using the AWS uh, device farm uh, because of uh, that was the only uh, device farm that uh, um, in which uh, we uh, uh, we're able to uh, pull the data generated from a device uh, afterwards. Um, unfortunately, um, the Firebase uh, test lab uh, doesn't allow you to do that. Uh, so you need to upload the apps, uh, of course, uh, run the tests that uh, are gonna generate all this data and uh, store it uh, in the device. And um, there is, with the particular case of uh, like this step, like the, um, like the completed um, check, uh, which basically uh, it is polling uh, the device farm in order to know when uh, all the tests have finished and at that point uh, retrieve all the data and be able to uh, download the artifacts. Um, and uh, then um, we have uh, some uh, scripts that, uh, you know, as uh, we uh, just mentioned, um, those are uh, written in Python, but uh, you can, can use uh, whatever you want to parse the data and also to um, like uh, package the, um, the data and uh, send it to the uh, data warehouse. Finally, uh, we are using mode uh, in order to uh, write all these queries and um, um, get in uh, and build in uh, those uh, reports and um, dashboards that uh, we uh, mentioned before. Um, what's next? So basically, um, as you have been seeing, um, you know, working uh, on performance and getting uh, metrics is not that uh, easy. Uh, so it is something that uh, you don't get uh, right like the very first time, right? So uh, of course, uh, we are thinking on um, working on adding more automation. Uh, there are some steps that uh, we still do uh, manually. Uh, like, for example, um, we don't know when all the tests uh, have finished and um, then uh, be able to run the, um, like the SQL uh, queries. So it would be great to, you know, have a, like, uh, like something, you know, automated that uh, runs all the queries, like a live, live um, uh, dashboard uh, with, um, you know, um, when uh, 90 build uh, has finished, you know, running all, all these uh, performance tests. Another um, uh, thing that uh, we are um, uh, we are um, trying to uh, figure it out is uh, um, these uh, like uh, triggers uh, slash thresholds. And let me explain you uh, what I mean with uh, by triggers. So uh, as I as I uh, mentioned before, uh, the idea is to have like uh, you know like some uh, kind of uh, ranges in which uh, you know we move. Uh, for the different um, for the different metrics that uh, we are trying to collect, and when you have that, um, then you will be able to define some thresholds, right? And the idea here is that uh, when you uh, have uh, those in place, uh, it would be great to be you know uh, warned when uh, you uh, have uh, passed uh, over any of those thresholds. Uh, and maybe just uh, send an email or a uh, Slack message or, or whatever, but uh, you are able to, um, you know, uh, be warned when uh, something happened or something went over uh, that uh, uh, threshold. And then, obviously, you will be able to uh, resonate about it and, um, and um, you, know, um, you know, make progress. Uh, finally, uh, well, not... Yeah, finally, um, sorry, whoops. 
uh, feature flags. Um, uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned before, um, with uh, the uh, like the telemetry production approach, uh, it will be great to have like a way to um, to know uh, to filter out some uh, devices, or even uh, if you um, find out that uh, you know um, these like um, um, performance uh, code that uh, you added um, is causing like uh, uh, problems to your users, you can basically um, you know. Put a you know uh, say like a, don't execute uh, this code a anymore uh, until you figure it out. Um, then um, just to um, summarize uh, all the uh, takeaways um, from this talk, um, I want to say like uh, performance is important, and uh, why we think it is important is because uh, it means money, uh, especially uh, if your uh, users are paying for your service. Uh, is like you know, if um, they are having like uh, problems and they are getting like a bunch of uh, complaints, um, you know, using your SDK um, means that uh, they are gonna say, hey, um, I'm gonna you know use a different service. So uh, it is uh, really important and something that uh, you need to look uh, into as well. Um, then uh, it is tricky, as you have seen, uh, it's not that easy. Uh, it's uh, especially, you know, hard because of, uh, you know, how um, the APIs uh, are built and there are not that many uh, information and also, um, you know, like, uh, the, you need to use, like, uh, different uh, tools and then uh, encompass all of them uh, together to, to make it uh, work. And um, another uh, takeaway is that, um, it is an ongoing effort. As uh, we mentioned, uh, normally um, you are not uh, in, a, in a company or uh, it's not like um, a normal uh, situation in which uh, you have a dedicated team. Uh, so you need to keep like working on other uh, like feature development. Um, so you need to do this um, iteratively and uh, learn from your uh, mistakes and you know, um, move on. And finally, and the most important one, is that uh, you need uh, a good amount of data. Uh, and uh, yesterday I was in a, in a talk uh, about uh, machine learning and, and the speaker was uh, you know, talking about like millions of samples. So this is not something that uh, you can say, hey, I run like uh, 100 tests and I have this data and now uh, I'm, you know, able to start like, uh, you know, getting uh, con conclusions about it. And uh, no, this is something that, uh, you know, takes time. Uh, and as uh, we uh, just described, uh, you need to, um, you know, um, wait until it gets normalized. And then at that point, you are able to, uh, you know, um, just make just uh, conclusions, right? Um, and that should be it. Uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, I have uh, some time uh, for uh, questions. So um, feel free to uh, do so uh, now. Uh, and uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Can you? In your performance testing, do you guys account for like loss of signal? Because a lot of GPS now are AGPS by assisted, so they, they get signal. If you have no signal, you don't you can't draw your map, even if you get the dot. And then also like for memory management, let's say I have like five or six app running and I'm running then the GPS app, is it gonna crash? Or is it gonna, you have to, you know, deal with the garbage collection and all that. Do you can you do this? Can you simulate this in the testing? Yeah, so part of developing the UI test was trying to isolate as much as, as many variables as possible. So GPS is a great question. And we actually aren't encompassing that in the test, where we are simulating the route with just reproduced GPS, up, like basically mock GPS data in order to run it in an isolated environment. But that's actually, that's another gap, right? Like that's hitting the GPS radio in the test is leaving out a piece of performance that we need to be taking account for. Um, so yeah. Yeah, that's uh, why um, we uh, took the approach for um, like um, you know the telemetry uh, approach for battery, uh, which uh, we know that uh, it it might you know uh, affect um, you know it, it might differ 
from uh, you know what the, we were running uh, like in CI and for you know from uh, what the, you actually could get from uh, you know the wild right uh, so uh, especially uh, for battery we use uh, that approach to get like uh, really insights on how you know um, you know was the, the battery drainage uh, on, on on the SDK, uh, which you know I, I can uh, continue talking about battery uh, because uh, you know there, there are a bunch of uh, problems to track uh, battery on Android, um, so we needed to uh, you know like uh, go uh, with this simple approach of uh, gathering only the battery level and then make uh, assumptions, uh, you know, and then do these calculations to to see how many you know uh, battery point levels, uh, you know were drained and then you know uh, send that data into the data warehouse and then be able to analyze it. So the issue where you mentioned you can't have the okay. So the issue that uh, Dan mentioned um, about running the 30 tests on CI, can't you just run 30 tests in parallel in the, in the device farm? Yeah, exactly. That that's actually like one of the future things that we're talking about, where we'll just kick off a build that will kick off that the the test in a separate CI process in in the device farm and not block our, our current pipeline, like our the current pipeline that we're running. So, yeah, that that's definitely right now. It's it's still manually triggered, um, but that's like one of the future improvements looking to be made there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah actually, we we are uh, thinking on uh, having like a uh, ninety builds. That uh, run all of this, and then another like optimization for those ninety builds because, as uh, Dan mentioned, uh, it takes uh, that many time. We we could uh, you know um, run them in parallel, and but uh, yeah, it's, it's like as we said, uh, we we just uh, you know a team of three people, <laughs> you know working on everything and, and anything. So it's like uh, we we don't have that uh, dedicated team. Uh, we we love to you know spend more time on on this, but uh, we we cannot. So. Any other questions? No? Cool. No. Thank, you, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, I have, um, you know, uh, if you are uh, from the DC area, uh, I'm uh, the DC Kotlin organizer. Um, well, one of them. Uh, and uh, we are um, hosting an event uh, July the 2nd. Um, uh, who um, Dan Lu um, from Capital One uh, will be presenting uh, uh, on um, Kotlin uh, an introduction. Uh, so um, feel free to uh, stop by, uh, look at the uh, meetup, um, and uh, please uh, um, ask BP. Uh, and um, again, if you have any other questions, uh, we are going to be around. So uh, feel free to. Um, Pulse you know, aside. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, if not, then uh, you can always uh, reach out uh, us uh, via Twitter. Um, and thank you again. Yeah, thanks.